Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you had a chance to use the restroom, get a drink, get a bite to eat, something. Um, we're going to get right into it out of respect for everybody's time and to, to keep on, on schedule. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly here and get back to Richard. Uh, yes, yeah, so if uh, another quick chance, if there's any questions, I know we talked about that. Um, you know, a lot of people will ask, you know, why? So why is the ETC important? I think it's important to understand the why behind the push for home modality. Um, I know I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, trends in, in dialysis at home and, and patient demographics. But like I saw in the chat how Michael had referenced the ProPublica article and and and, you know, COVID is having a huge impact on on some of these projections and trends. So, you know, there may be some some more data coming soon, um, hopefully based on on the the impact of COVID in, in our environment and I know that that, that ProPublica article that's been out in and around in the community um, is, is a really good read. I, I, I loved it. I'm uh, thankful for Mike sh sharing that with with a lot of his connections and um, you know and I, and it kind of leads me to talking about advances in dialysis treatment and and how these advances um, are saving lives and and you know in, in that article you got an illustration of someone who was an in-center patient. And then all I could think about while I was reading that article in my mind was, you know, um, what in the world was that person doing in center in the first place? Um, uh, because in the article, I know like, you know, you talk, you're talking about a, a person who had been a dialysis technician for so many years and they were in center. And I'm thinking, God, why, why, would, why would someone that worked in center, you know, Go to in center if you could do this at home and and i always wonder like what the situation was what the dynamic was when i think about that so it's important to understand like some of these protection you know projections and, and how they you know impact our patients because every every number represented in these in this conversation is is a person um it's someone's mom dad brother sister uncle parent i mean it, it a grandparent it, it doesn't there's somebody's family member and somebody's somebody and I think that's important to think about. I know I, I've always shared that in my talks is all of our patients are somebody, somebody, right? There's someone, someone out there. And so um, mortality rate for dialysis patients has been, it has been declining. And um, that could be related to better infection control, better nutritional supplementation. Um, but before we expose the percentage, I want to take a, a quick poll. And now I know if everybody is not familiar with with uh, with Zoom, but you have the ability to to raise your your hand in in here. Um, so just I, I, if you if just everybody raise your anybody that thinks that um, a show of hands that you're good that the the uh, death rate uh, has declined from dialysis from 2001. Uh, do you think it's less than 20 percent? Uh, raise your hand. And if you think it's uh, less than 20%, let's see. Everybody think it's, thinks it's more, right? Okay. So anybody that thinks it's more than 20%, let's go ahead and show the number, Mike. The advance, you should be able to advance it. Are we seeing it? All right, well, I'll give the answer. It's 30%. It's, it's, is it going forward? 30%, yes, 30%. So, you know, just, just, like, just like we said, from 2001 to 2018, there's been a 30% decline in death rates for all dialysis patients. Um, but the death rate for ESRD is still over three times higher than that of the general Medicare population. So. Um, there's some good news and bad news in that in that slide, right? The good news for dialysis patients is it's decreased 30%, but we still have a long way to go even uh, to even approach survival rates of cancer, diabetes, congestive heart failure, and stroke. Um, so the impact of change in mortality rates, more patients than ever will remain on long-term dialysis. So that means we're able to keep our patients alive longer, um, but that also means that we have to care for them longer. Um, and, and that space is important for, for a lot of what we do. So where will we be in 2025? You know, what will you be doing or, or what will, and, and what will you be facing 
um, you know, uh, you know, so if you're a nephrologist, would you have completed your fellowship and uh, pay, or if you're going to school to become a nephrologist and are you paying off your loans? Are you in a practice or treating the growing number of dialysis patients? Um, and how many are those patients? I mean, these are all things that our future nephrologists are having to think about in these discussions and looking at the impact of 650,000 more patients. Now we know from that article that, that you know, this is one of the first times in history where um, dialysis populations have, have decreased. However, we're still looking at this influx of more patients coming. And, uh, be, you know, this is a five-year outlook. And we, you saw this slide earlier, uh, but before the pandemic, um, this, this is what we were looking at. If you consider the number of dialysis clinics that we build across the country, not just unique to our location or, or the location that I'm in, but in all over the country, looking at 650,000 ESRD patients in five years. So it's overwhelming when you think about our healthcare system and the maintenance plan with our primary care providers, our insurance companies and access care improvements we have nationally, um, we, would, we would hope that we would be able to reduce the amount of patients with uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension and reduce potential for these uh, 650,000 patients, but this is where we are. Um, how do we manage these patients? Um, we would have to build many, many more centers and, and, you know, as, and imagine that would be one of our biggest barriers because space is, is a hard thing to come by in, in this environment. So how do we manage building more facilities for patients to coming to us? And if you think about it in terms of how many patients, what percentages of these patients could we take home? Um, if we just think in terms of 50% by 2025, we could reduce the number of clinics that we have, we have to build. Additionally, across the nation, uh, you know, there's, you know, the fellowship positions that are open. Um, in the United States, 40% of those are unfilled. So we have a, a, lot, a lot of thinking to do about how to approach this problem. Um, 650,000 patients we need to build more facilities for, um, or we need a, a lot more staff to serve. If you think in terms of, of some of the hurdles, again, we've talked about earlier regard to staffing, um, we certainly have pockets. We know that there is an, a national shortage of nurse, nurses, like we said earlier. Um, and we have, uh, have to think in those terms as well, um, not just nurses, but patient care technicians as well. Um, so this is a part of the collaboration that we have with, with some of our providers and some of the, the vendors out there is to not only identify who are great candidates, but who could be candidates if we, we remove the barriers from their ability to do so. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the next slide. So looking at this slide, you have, um, where we are today, you have 88.1% um, of our patients in center HD. Only 11.9% of those patients are at home. And this is why I really wanted to lean heavily on HHD because if you look at the breakdown here, 10% of our patients on PD and under 2% penetration on HHD. And now that's, that's, a, that's, that's the concern is that, you know, there's a lot of talk around uh, different pieces of PD to HHD as well to help you know stimulate that that home penetration because in a lot of in a lot of situations what happens is these PD patients as PD like I said earlier doesn't last forever as PD begins to to uh, no longer work for our patients then those patients don't always get transitioned to the other home option which means that those patients go where in center. It's the only other place for them to go. So if we could take that, that number of PD patients and, and expand those leaving PD to going into another home option like HHD, this could potentially help grow this piece of the pie. And that's exactly what, what my focus is on a daily basis is to work on not just growing one modality over the other, but keeping patients at home overall, because we know it's the better environment for these patients. Um, I know we, I talk to um, large physician group practices all the time. One of the things that I, I remember when I first started with Next Stage is hearing uh, a physician at a physician event, hearing uh, a physician pose to a large group practice. There was this particular practice in our area who had over 300 PD patients in their practice. And, then, and, and that's a large group. That's, that's pretty large compared to most PD practices in the program in the country. And 
the director of that program proudly stated, well, we have over 300 patients. We have, you know, one of the largest programs in the country. And it's like, okay, great. Now, how many patients do you train on PD every year? Well, we have over 100 patients we train every year. We train over 100 patients every year. That's, that's we, we are big advocates of our home PD and we want to get those patients home. Well, that's great. Now, how many patients do you drop or, or do you lose every year? And his face changed. Um, his answer was 100, over 100 patients. So in that, in that conversation, what I took away immediately was, wow, like you could hear the room silence when he said that because they trained 100 patients a year, but they also lost 100 patients a year. And the next question that, that, that expert physician asked was, how many of those patients that, that you drop from PD every year do you capture in home hemo? And the answer was zero. So that means 100 patients a year are dropping out of PD and going to the in-center unit. So the conversation was, if you could just capture even 10% of those patients, those 100 patients, that would be an additional 10 patients a year that you could put in your home program. Um, and the home program in that, in that particular group for home hemo um, only had a, a nine patient population at the time. Um, so it, it was something like, you know, we could say like, obviously they were missing um, one of the pieces of low hanging fruit uh, where you could educate patients a little better on, um, on, on that second option for home and manage your, your, your losses a little better in, in terms of home growth. Um, so if we go to the next slide, you'll see here, you'll see that we have some, just some survival information again. And, and when you look at, um, at this, you're gonna see like your, your standard new to dialysis patient survival here, um, one year versus two years, 78% and 67%. And then when you look at PD for, for, for that same metric, you're looking at 90% to 80%. So there's a huge benefit here. And then when you look, go to the, the HHD side, you see it's very similar. So why are, why are we not getting more, of, more penetration in the more frequent HHD when it's so much better than in-center and it's very similar to PD? What are some of those barriers and what can we do to kind of help get us to, to where we need to be? So PD and more frequent HHD are associated with higher one year and two year survival compared to in-center HHD or HD rather. So I, I always ask that question. If these two modalities are better than in-center, why is it that the majority of our patients are here in-center? That always stuns me. And, and it's not to say that our in-center teams don't do a great job because our, our teams are great. The bottom line is they can't compete with the way that the benefits of, of, di of more frequent therapy really, really affect our patients. So it's, it's important to remember that. It's, we're never saying that in-center staff or the in-center teams are not doing a good job. What we're saying is, is that the way we dialyze patients in-center is not as good as what we can do when we put the patient in a home modality. So when we look at the, the next slide here, you're gonna see the two different modalities, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about this. So um, this may be a little bit of a rhetorical question, but true or false, compared to other countries, the US has a relatively high percentage of dialysis patients being treated at home. What do you guys think that would be? If you, if you think that's true, raise your hand, that we have a high percentage of dialysis patients treating at home. We obviously saw the numbers, right? It's not, it's false. Um, actually, the US ranks pretty low in terms of home dialysis penetration. Today, approximately only 12 and a half percent of dialysis patients treat at home. Um, in fact, we're currently ranked 27th out of 63. So um, we're kind of middle of the road on, on that. Um, we have a great opportunity to introduce more patients to home dialysis in the US with two options. Um, Again, peritoneal dialysis uses the small capillary blood vessels of the peritoneum as a dialysis and ultrafiltration membrane. Um, the catheter is surgically inserted into the abdomen, in, in most cases inside the abdomen. The catheter has multiple holes to exchange dialysate into and out of the peritoneal space at various intervals. Uh, the concentration gradient between the plasma and the dialysate drives solute removal. 
high glucose concentrations or other osmotic agents uh, in the dialysate drives ultrafiltration. So that's pretty much like a basic description of, of PD. Uh, with home hemodialysis, uh, we use a system or a medical device to filter blood. Um, the vascular access through a venous catheter, arteriovenous fistula, or a graft. More on, on those down in, a few, in another module or another training, but um, that's one thing that is a common misconception out there is that um, if you have a CVC or it, you, can't, you can't do home hemodialysis, and that's simply just not true. Um, home hemodialysis can be done with any type of access that you have. Um, and then there's specialized equipment. Um, as well as program policies and, process and procedures that are, that are designed to make home hemodialysis therapy as safe and reliable as in-center dialysis. So that's something that we want to make sure we understand is that, um, you know, a lot of people have that misconception, you know, that, that it's safer to be at home or at, uh, in the center. And, and we know that, that that's just simply not the case, that, that it's just as safe, it can be just as safe and reliable as being in center, and sometimes more. Um, I like to show this next slide um, because this next slide, it's, it's a look at, and I know this is a borrowed slide from a next stage presentation, but I mean, you can't, you can't get those, those pictures just anywhere. It's hard to come by some of these pictures, but one of the things that people, and, and I know I had the same, the same uh, conception in the beginning was that home hemodialysis was new. It was a new concept. And the reality is, is it was brought to my attention that it's not. Um, actually, home dial or dialysis has its origins in, in the home. Um, in the beginning, there were no dialysis centers on every corner that you could um, take your, your, your patients to or, or, or be, be treated in. Um, it was done in the home. And, and if you look at these machines in, in the home now, I mean, you look at some of the space that that take up. I mean, look at the size of these machines and, 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 and you know, how it's almost, pre it's, it's a prehistoric view of where we are today compared to what we have out there for us now. I mean, when you, when you look at what we have available today on the next slide here, um, you know, these are just, I mean, and this is, again, it's an, it's an older picture, but it, it, I like the comparison across the board where you see how machines have, have kind of gone down in size, right? They've shrunk and you know, some of the, the different models of, of the systems out there that are doing home dialysis now, there's some that are a little bigger than, than the next stage machine, and and um, and that's okay. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of new uh, home dialysis machines that are going to be coming out in the market, and they're going to they're going to vary in size and range. But the idea that we've been able to make these technological advances to help support patients doing uh, home hemodialysis, versus you know compared to the, the what we saw in the picture before, um, it, it, it's really kind of amazing. And I always like to to take a look at that and 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 compare and, and see wow. I mean, we, we've really come a long way, um, even, even though we, we may not feel like we've, we, we've done a lot different. Um, so the next slide, again, is uh, another, another slide that we showed earlier. Um, but in addition to providing, I wanted to cover just a few more things on this. And in addition to providing effective treatment, more frequent therapies can offer a lot of different lifestyle advantages as compared to in-center treatment. Um, with both PD and HHD, there is an improved five-year survival. We've seen that, right? So we look at some of the other data in the PD, uh, with PD and more frequent home hemo. Um, there's a lot of similar benefits with more frequent types of therapy. Obviously, PD is more uh, continuous, um, and home hemo patients are, are hopefully doing at least five days a week. The clinical evidence and data are based on all that five or six days a week on home hemo, like I said earlier. Um, but just again, a show of hands, uh, but how many of you would consider home dialysis therapy? I mean, if you, if you had to choose for yourself or a family member, um, you know, if your mother were, or father were a patient, or if uh, you yourself were the patient, how many would choose home? You know, um, and, and, and my, my, I asked this question because I think I want us to think about this. And, um, you know, we didn't, we had a national survey of nephrologists, um, more than 90% of them said they would choose a home dialysis therapy for themselves or their loved ones. Um, it was the home hemodialysis was the preferred home option for the majority of these, of these uh, surveyed nephrologists. But when you look at what we do today, 
while they're while these nephrologists all say that this is what they would do for themselves home hemodialysis or home dialysis in general it's almost 90 it's almost the same 90 percent are actually sending their patients in center so there's a little bit of hypocrisy in that and and i look at that and say you know while we would do this for ourselves we we tend not to to find a way to do this for our patients and it's something that we really need to kind of change um, ultimately the choice depends on a variety of factors um, including like medical condition, lifestyle, uh, comfort with administering treatment of home. But at the end of the day, um, the one there, there's one big piece that we can correct, and that's the comfort with administering treatment at home. Um, for those physicians and clinicians and practitioners out there who are not comfortable with, with the, uh, administering treatments at home, it's an easy solution. You, you just get educated you know, get yourself educated and trained. And in these sessions like this is what's gonna help you do that. Um, I know that I've, I've been in a lot, Mike, Michael was saying earlier, we've, we've gone through a lot of conferences and, you know, done the circuit together. And I remember being at a dinner with, with a, a group of clinicians, nurses, doctors, everybody. And um, we were sitting at the table with, with, the, with the nurse who basically said, you know, I, I, I promote home for all of our patients, but home hemo patients just don't want to do more than four times a week. It's, it's too much work for them. It's, it's, um, it's, it's just too much, too much of a burden on them. And what she didn't realize is across the table from her was a physician who had a very successful large home hemo program. And he looked at her and he said, you know, I would have to disagree with you. He goes, I'm, uh, I would, I would tell you that, that just from hearing you talk about the home hemo option right now at, at this table, I would say that it sounds like when you're educating your patients, it sounds like you would probably be um, inserting your own clinician bias into the conversation because maybe you're not comfortable with home hemodialysis as much as you should be or could be. Um, he said, I have no problem. He has, I, over, I have over a hundred patients on home hemo um, in, in several different practices or clinics. And um, he said, I, I, none of them have a problem doing five days a week. He said, so I would challenge you to, to, to evaluate your conversation and your education style with your patients, because if you present the facts and you present the information, most patients don't have a problem with doing five day a week therapy. And, and it was something that I took notice of because you know we see it a lot in this industry. When we work with home nurses, we see it a lot. They, they tend to, to really, really kind of, we can't, if we're not comfortable with something, we tend to stay away from it. And I think that does sometimes can do our patients uh, an injustice. So let's go ahead and look at the next uh, slide. We're gonna look at the five-year survival piece. And the one thing that I really wanna talk about in, in the basics of understanding um, you know, home modalities here is, is you're looking at the, at the survival again. We've talked a lot about survival. And, and that's important. I mean, why would we do that? I mean, if you think about it from a patient perspective, what's the first thing patients ask is like, how can, how long can I expect to live now that I have this diagnosis? Or, you know, and, and if you think about that with when we compared our, our survival to cancer, um, you know, oncology is a diff is, is, has a very different approach a lot of times than we do in, in dialysis or in, in renal failure, in, in nephrology. And what they, what they do is a lot of times patients will come in and they'll see their doctor and the doc they'll, this doctor will tell them, well, you know, your, your treatment options are here and each of these options have this chance of survival. Um, we don't do that with dialysis patients. In a lot of cases, our dialysis patients don't hear any of this survival information. Um, if you were to walk into an in-center unit today and ask the patient, do you know what your five-year survival is? Um, do, do you think they'd be able to answer that question? Probably not. Um, and it's probably never been talked about. And, and I know it's like the doom and gloom effect. A lot of times we, we don't want to talk about the things that are uncomfortable or have, you know, some kind of negative connotation. But, you know, if it were me, I would want to know. Um, you know, what my best chance of survival was. And, and I don't think patients hear a lot of this. Um, obviously, transplant is something we talk about a lot. Um, and, and that's everyone's goal. But the reality is, is that not everyone is going to get a transplant. Um, but everyone can have access to home options, and, and whether or not they want to go home. Um, so, you know, and, and that's, and that's true. And I see in the comment, no, physicians don't talk about it. You're right. 
And I think that's that's what we need to to fix. Um, I think this is the biggest piece that we're missing. Um, so, you know, as a basic of, of home hemo, I think the first thing is have the conversation. Um, you know, when we talk about peritoneal dialysis in general, you know, it's, I, I can go, go to the next slide here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, when we look, look at peritoneal dialysis in, in, in general here, uh, you're going to see, again, we talked about how using the lining of the belly or peritoneal membrane to filter blood of toxins and, and extra fluids. CAPD is commonly what patients will start on um, and, and doing manual exchanges. And when we say manual exchanges, we just want to refer to the fact that they use gravity to drain fluid from within their peritoneal cavity. And then they, they dump that used fluid out and then replace it with fresh fluid. Um, with APD or with CAPD, or, or, I'm sorry, with the, with the CCPD, uh, cycler based therapy. Um, it includes several modality types. So there's the continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis, which uses a machine uh, called a cycler. And, and there's several different machines out there that do that. Um, that'll do com complete these, these fills and, and, and draining cycles or exchanges um, throughout the night while they sleep. And, um, you know, and, and that's one that's, that's typically um, more, more, common in our P PD populations because they can do it while they sleep. It's, it doesn't really take away any time from their, their normal day-to-day -day life. Um, so let's look at the potential benefits of peritoneal dialysis on the next slide here. Um, so compared to three time a week conventional in-center hemodialysis, um, we're gonna have better preservation of the residual kidney function. Um, this is an important piece uh, across the board. And, and, and the, real, the real reason behind this is, is the fact that, you know, when you're doing peritoneal dialysis, those patients are constantly having some fluid, which allows the kidneys to kind of, if you have some residual function, to continue to utilize that residual function. Um, in, in, in hemodialysis on the in-center side especially, um, you know, that, that kidney can get, you know, what we say, like how we say lazy. Uh, because the machine's doing all the work for the kidney at that point, and and that re that residual function usually won't last as long, um, and so using uh, peritoneal dialysis as a first option for dialysis is actually a very good way of helping uh, retain that residual renal function, um, and and it and also it's associated with overall health and well-being of the dialysis patient. So most of your your, your clinical benefits come get, are improved with people who have some residual function. Um, incre increased transplantation incidence. And, 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 you know, and it's not that patients that are on PD get a higher score or get, you know, put, pushed up in the list um, because of, they chose a, a home modality. But what it is, is, is that that patient ha actually has uh, a, a, better, a better health score basically. Um, they're, they're better prepared for transplant and are more capable of, of you know, completing all of, all of the, the checklists, uh, you know, the boxes, checking all those boxes on the checklist for transplantation because they have better health scores, mainly cardiac function. Um, a lot of times what ends up happening is patients on a home modality like PD have better cardiovascular uh, outcomes, which helps them promote on the list for a transplant. Um, greater quality of lights. Our PD patients have a higher self-reported quality of life score than standard in-center dialysis patients. And the reason for that is just because, imagine if you, you could do your dialysis at night and have your days free to do whatever you wanted, whether it was work, school, family um, activities, it's, it's important to just remember that, that you know, these patients are, are living a, a more normal life. They're not tied to an, a rigid in-center schedule. And you know, being told you know when to be there, what time to be there, and what days to be there, and then you know, just just being able to to be on a routine that is more uh, you know similar to what they did before they were diagnosed with renal failure. And again, the no vascular access needed. I always caution against this one, though. I mean, it's great to talk about it if that's what's going to get the patient over the fence on on choosing a home modality versus choosing an in-center option, then that's great. But I always wanna make sure that we, we talk about the fact that, you know, we, yeah, PD will not always will last forever. Hopefully you get a transplant. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't, but just be ready for the fact that you should know what your next modality option is gonna be. And if PD no longer works for you, 
needles are going to be a necessity that you have to, you know, kind of face. Um, and so it's always good to have that conversation when you're promoting it. Yes, you don't need a vascular access right now, no needles. However, at some point, you, you will need to have needles in an almost, almost definite. So let's think about that and prepare and see what we can do to get you ready for that point. On the next slide, um, so this is going to talk a little bit about more about preserving the residual renal function and why it's important in, in the commencement of dialysis. So again, you know, residual renal function will help overall achieve better uh, fluid uh, volume goals, volume management goals. Um, it'll help us maintain better phosphorus control and that removal of the middle molecule. Now, if you you know, for most of us, we, we kind of know middle molecule removal can only take place with either residual function or longer treatments. And so if you don't have residual function, you know, this may be a point of conversation where you want to talk about, you know, some a, a therapy like a CCPD where you're doing a continuous like cycler based therapy on PD or doing a home chemo nocturnal option where you dialyze for six to eight hours more frequently at night. Those are the ways to, to kind of help that middle molecule removal. Um, it also has a reduced occurrence of LVH. So uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is something that um, is, pre is, is present in, in about almost 100% of our, our patients on, on dialysis, um, especially in center. And so uh, that residual function can help um, mitigate some of that LVH that we, we're dealing with. And that's usually a condition that, that doesn't necessarily go away. It can be reduced. Uh, you can reduce the occurrence of it with our uh, residual function. You can also um, you re reduce the, the, the impact of it on, on the patient with more frequent therapy. However, um, this is something that we're, we deal with consistently throughout um, the patient's journey on dialysis. Um, so a decline in residual renal function would usually contribute to worsening anemia, nutritional status, and also inflammation. Um, so those are all things to think about. Um, when we talk about PD, we also could be, uh, it could be an excellent therapy for a wide range of patients. So PD is, is, is usually, like I said, is, is what I would call um, the best first choice for patients who are having to start dialysis. Um, you know, this is for incident patients patients with residual renal function, um, patients who have a desire to travel. I mean, it's a lot easier to travel with PD, you know, because most of the, the vendors out there will deliver solutions to wherever the, the patients go in the, inter, in the uh, intercontinental United States. Um, they can be, you know, shipped to any location in the United States um, so patients can travel and ha not have to drag all their supplies with them. All they have to do is take their cycler or if they are doing manual exchanges, they just need the bags and they can do that just about anywhere with that's, that's clean and safe environment. Um, patients with, uh, uh, with inadequate storage area that, you know, that's one of the, one of the things with, with PD that you have to consider is it's a, it's a large amount of supplies. So patients need to have some place to put them. But like I explained earlier, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, if, if a homeless person can find a church willing to store his supplies for him, um, you know, um, there, there are a lot of things that we can do to kind of think outside the box and, and figure a way to some help uh, overcome some of these, the, these challenges. Uh, patients who value independence and flexibility are, are great candidates. Um, you know, if you've ever worked in center and you have that patient that walks in and says, okay, I only wanna take off this much fluid and I want my blood flow set at this rate, and I want my machine turned so I can see what those numbers are. This is the ideal patient for who we want to send home because if they're that independent and, and they want that kind of that kind of control over their, their treatment, then we should be setting them up for an opportunity to do that. And, and those are the kind of patients that would you know easily be successful at home on a home-based therapy. Um, so on this, I'm gonna go ahead and I want I want to have this next uh, slide, it's a video. Um, I wanted to, to play this because this is a patient who has, he's run the gambit and he's a friend of, of Sam and I, and I just would like to um, ha have you guys watch his story and, and, and share that with you. Oh, no sound.
Hey, Mike, you got sound? During their dialysis journey. I'm a patient advocate for Pacinius and Next Stage. When dialysis started for me in 2009, all I could do was pray. I didn't know what the future had for me. I'm one of those patients who basically have gone through every. Thing a patient can actually go through during their dialysis journey. In clinic, I did three days a week, five hours a day. The challenges in center, um, the recovery time for me. I would sit in my car just to get my mind and the energy I needed to drive 15 minutes from home. And when I got home, any dialysis patient could tell you, you want to eat, sleep, and that's it. PD was my next journey. Uh, the wonderful thing about PD was that I was at home and I can do my dialysis while I sleep. You wake up, you disconnect, and guess what? You got your whole day ahead of you to do as you please. A month after me starting PD, I felt amazing. I took a cruise. I, I bottled up my machine. They shipped all my boxes to the ship. Seven days in the Caribbean. I'm enjoying myself while doing dialysis. When I started uh, solo, uh, Omimo, uh, my doctor had improved me for it. He felt that being that I was self-sufficient enough doing PD, that he felt that I would be a great candidate for solo home dialysis. I did three hours of treatment five days a week. Uh, it gave me the energy to go hiking, bike riding, work it out, feeling great, interaction with my family, or just hanging out with friends, enjoying myself. The challenges for me in home hemo was the needle. They gave me like a little block of cheese, that I, I call it cheese, to practice cannulating. Trust me, I was on that thing like I was at the gym, trying to get this needle in. First time I put it in, I was dizzy. Second time, third time, by my fourth time, I didn't want anyone to cannulate me again. Solo home hemo prepared me for transplant. Without that, um, I wouldn't be complete. What inspires me to do patient advocacy? It's honestly after everything that I've endured. I've been through everything that these patients are going through to help them through every single step. Let them know what they can expect. Let them know how they can feel. Let them know from my perspective that it regained my life. Your story is not over. Never give up. So I know that seems like a little bit of a commercial. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I I I didn't want to like let that go without stating. I know that's a little because Rasheen is a patient advocate for next stage, but I feel like his story is very valuable. So I, I wanted you guys to hear like a little bit of that, like how he, you know, was able to get his energy up and do more. Uh, hiking and things like that and, and vacationing. And so you can see kind of the things that we've been talking about. I mean, he's done the gambit being on PD um, and HHD as a solo patient as well. Um, he also has was an LVAD patient. He was the first patient to be on an LVAD and home hemodialysis at the same time. Um, and he had a very unique story where he finally was transplanted. Um, and, and, and if you ever get a chance to hear Rasheen, speak. I know he speaks for a, like, just like Sam, he speaks at a lot of different uh, uh, conferences and, and, and different meetings and stuff. Um, he's, it's a great listen. He's, he's got a great story, but um, just looking at, you know, kind of are your patients choosing home? So what we know is that when patients are educated, they're more likely to make that decision to go home. 70% uh, of patients that we, that we surveyed chose a home modality after going through an education program. So that education program is the first step 
if you can get your patients to, to, to go to an education or to be educated, or if you can sit with the patient and educate them on their modality options, <clears throat> excuse me, the majority of those patients will choose a home option. But again, it goes back to the point, if we're not talking about it, how, will they, how are they supposed to know? 89% um, of nurses said they would choose a home therapy for themselves. Like, so we know nurses would choose a home option as well. So why not help educate these patients so that we can get them to the information they need to make the same decision that we would make for ourselves. And then again, 93% of nephrologists said they would choose a home therapy for themselves. Again, if you do it for yourself, why wouldn't you do it for your patients? So this is something that, that I really, um, I really am, am passionate about. Um, I feel like if a patient has all the information and they choose not to go home, then, then that's okay. Um, but if they are choosing in center because that's what their, their doctor recommended because they didn't have, and they didn't get all the information and had no idea that home was an option for them, um, then, then that's where I have a problem. And, and that's where I would like to see us do a better job of, of advocating for our patients in, in that way. So in order to do that, we have to change the, the mentality of, of, what we're, of, of our, our industry. Um, we have to consider home first as a modality option for most of your patients. Um, we have to understand how patients may benefit from the clinical qual and quality of life outcomes of home therapy and educate patients on their home options. Now, I know one of the things, I do a lot of lunch and learns uh, around Southern California and actually all over the Western United States because I end up helping out in a lot of different areas in, in, in my regular eight to five that I do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and one of the things that I always hear pushed back is like, well, if we help all of our patients go home, you know, what, what am I gonna do for a job? You know, you're, you're taking, you know, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna have a place to work if all the patients go home. And, and I can tell you from experience, um, almost 26 years in this industry, I have yet to see a home program shut down an in-center unit. Um, it just never happens. <laughs> it's not something that takes place. So I think there'll always be a place for, for in-center uh, uh, in, in, in our patient population. Um, the other piece to this is that, you know, the, nothing is, to, is limiting anyone from uh, learning how to, to work in a home program. I, as I, again, speak from my own experience, um, you know, I worked as a, as a PCT in a home program before I had my nursing license. Um, I, I, that now I'm more and more in today's environment because of all of the staffing shortages that are out there. Um, we're finding that it's more valuable for, for dialysis workers and clinicians to become multifaceted. Um, it's, it makes more sense for you to have, instead of being an, an in-center dialysis nurse or an uh, acute dialysis nurse or a home dialysis nurse, to just be a dialysis nurse or a dialysis technician in general and know how to function in all of those different um, environments. So as you become more educated and more experienced in, in functioning in other areas of the, of the industry, um, you know, you become more marketable for, for jobs. So there, there is no limitation to what you can do. There are a lot of roles out there for, for clinicians to be involved in home modalities. Um, so at this point, um, we're gonna, we're gonna go into a little bit about the, um, the patient demographics. And when I talk about patient demographics, I, I, would, I would can tell you that, you know, I always get the question, who is the perfect patient um, for, for a home modality? And, and the answer to that is, you know, just basically, there, there's no such thing. I mean, are there patients that would do well out there or better than others? Um, but what I hear a lot of times is when I ask groups, what do you think the patient, the best patient for a home modality is? A lot of times I hear, um, you know, things like, well, um, you know, a, a patient who has um, a college education or is more educated or younger, um, you know, patients that, that um, tend to, to be more self-sufficient. And, and while those qualities all lean to being successful as a home patient, 
I wouldn't argue that. I think, yeah, those patients definitely do well on home dialysis. Um, but but what about what about patients who who are not um, the, fit in in that category or in those categories that don't fit that 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 profile? Um, I can I can tell you from my own experience, um, you know, patients that that I and I always tell the in center crews this when I do lunch and learns and and in services I say, you know, let me tell you who I want to talk to in your in-center unit. The patients that I think are best candidates for going home are the easiest ones to get to go home. Show me your patients who are um, non-adherent. I want to know who the patient who misses treatments on a regular basis. I want the patient who comes in fluid overloaded on a regular basis. I want the one who's struggling to hit their, their, their um, you know, get their labs in, in order. Um, Show me the ones who sign off early and, and, and leave. And, and everybody looks at me like, what do you mean? Why would you send that patient home? And I say to them all the time is that there's always a reason why that patient is signing off early. There's a reason why that patient um, doesn't show up all the time. There's a reason why um, their labs are out of range. Um, and, and usually if I understand the reason why, it's something we can correct or help fix with home dialysis. And if we can fix the why behind why they're non-adherent, then that patient, how much more successful could that patient be uh, on dialysis? Um, you know, would that patient be that typical oh, sign off early type patient? Most of the time when patients are signing off early, it's because they have either a bad experience on, on the machine or they have somewhere to be. And uh, if there are um, not showing up to dialysis, it, it's because there's, there was something that prevented them from coming to dialysis because of the rigid schedule that they're on. So if we could take out those variables from those patients and help them understand, you know, they could do this at home on their own schedule and eliminate those, those stressors and, and help them feel better. Um, you know, if you feel better, why would you, you know, you had less fluid to take off and you're not cramping, why would you sign off early? Or if you're doing a more frequent therapy when it when it fit into your lifestyle, um, would, you wouldn't even need to run a four hour treatment. You could run, you know, five, two and a half to three hour treatments. That changes everything. The conversation is different. Um, and it's finding a way to make those those barriers go away and, and implementing a different type of therapy that could um, offer them options. And this is where we're at. So, I know um, we're, we're coming up on, on another uh, break here, but I wanted to leave you with that before we go into talking about common objections and the rest of the, the slides that I have to go through before we finish up today. But I wanted to leave you with that because I really wanna make sure everyone is thinking about, about the patient in that sense. It's like, um, you know, we really wanna understand that, that these patients are, are, are not just non-compliant because they want to be non-compliant or not adherent. They're not coming into the house saying, you know what, I want to make everybody miserable and I want to feel bad today when I get off of this machine. What they're saying, what they're doing is, is they're dealing with the challenges the best way they know how. And it's important for us to think in, in that perspective and put ourselves in those shoes because I think if we can, um, if we can, if we can change the conversation and make it more about why the patient should want to do this and really come to, to them where they are in their life and say, you know, what is it that you're going through? Then, then this is where we can really meet them at, at, their, at their crossroads and figure out what the best option for them is. Um, so with that, um, Mike, I would open it up uh, for any additional questions if there are any. Um, and if not, we can, uh, you know, you can facilitate the break if you'd like. Sure. Thank, thanks again, Richard. That, that was great and um, uh, definitely great segue into the next section. Um, I know me and you, that's, that's probably half of our conversations is about these, these uh, alienated patients, if you will, or these patients that have that bias, you know, uh, hovering over them of their clinicians of, you know, they, they can't do it because uh, of their behaviors, their patterns on the in center, which is a total inconvenience and a, a, a you know it's it's just a bummer for anybody um, to be in that setting from several perspectives of the convenience to the actual um, uh, the the recovery time to the intradialytic complications and 
the fears of, of uh, staff competency and all of these sort of things. So, um, you know, somebody who's really on their toes can sometimes be our most difficult patient, if you will, or challenging patient. But when they, when they transition into that home setting, they become the standout, you know, the outlier, if you will. And we've talked about several cases, um, you know, uh, that we both have experienced over the years of people that, you know, are going on, uh, you know, over a decade of being able to live that independent life and be themselves. And hey, some of us want to make people miserable. We, we can do that really good at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know I do. <laughs> so, hey, <laughs> any, any questions from anybody on the line? Sam, is that a, is that a question from you? I see a raised hand. Well, you know, I, I, one of the groups that I always like to talk about are our non-compliant patients. Um, that's a word that everybody that knows us as a group, uh, as a whole, knows that we all hate that word non-compliant. Um, sometimes that word non-compliant can be easily substituted for the word human. You know, we're human. Life happens. Shit happens, guys. Um, <laughs> And that's true. I mean, uh, nobody's day always goes perfectly as planned. And, and that's the thing. But um, I like talking about, you know, people often say, use the reasons that we're trying to send somebody home to keep them in center. And so we're like, you know, the non-compliant patient is a per person to send home. And then there's somebody in center going, no, they can't go home. They're just non-compliant. All right. Let me tell you what, if a truly non-compliant patient all right if to be a truly non-compliant patient we all end up in the same place i was that non-compliant patient all right all non-compliant patients truly non-compliant patients end up in the same place the er mm -hmm. now if they're non-compliant at home well you know they end up in, in the er and only really hurting themselves if they're non-compliant in clinic they ruin everybody else's day. You know, they throw the schedule off. You know, people are running around trying to figure out what to do with this person's not coming. Um, so you want, you know, you could have both ways. I think the best way would be, hey, you know, let them go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's something that we can easily take care of. But a, a lot of non-compliant patients, they just want control, you know. Uh, right. How many of you wake up in the morning and you just have a bad attitude and don't want to go to work, right? Well, that happens to you. It happens to us too. Like I wake up in the morning throwing fists and go, I don't want to go, right? So, yeah. you know, sometimes the only control we have over our disease is to not come. And, and that's the deal, you know? So, um, yeah. you know, think, put yourself in those shoes, those shoes and, uh, you know, everybody knows the more you call me non-compliant, the worse of a candidate for transplant and home therapy I look like on paper. Right. So, you know, try not to use that word, y'all. There are other ways to find out what the problem is if there's non-compliance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, and, and you, you know, there's a story there too, and I'll just quickly share this, Mike, before we, we break, but I, you know, you know, I worked with this patient. He was he was labeled non-compliant. This was this was a while back. This was probably back in 2007, um, and um, he wanted to know more about home home hemo specifically. He because he knew the story about my dad. I was an in center technician taking care of him at the time, and he wanted to know more about my dad. And so, um, you know, he he kept saying, "Well, I think I could do that. I think I could be a home hemo patient." And so I advocated for him and everybody, you would not believe the, the, the amount of resistance I got from dietitians, social worker, even the nephrologist said, this guy is a horrible patient in center. Why would we do that to, to ourselves and to him and send him home? And I said, look, the worst case scenario, he goes home, he tries it, he fails, he, he ends up back in center. <laughs> no harm, no foul, right? At least we know we tried and it was, you know, we made the effort. So after a couple of weeks of, of, you know, just badgering them over this guy, they finally said, all right, you know what, take him, you, you can try him out. And, and if it doesn't work out within the first couple of weeks, we'll just bring him back to in center. And I said, fine, I'll take it. So we moved him over. Um, he cannulated himself the first day. 
like successfully cannulated himself. And I asked him, how did, how did you, in your mind, how did you do that? And he's like, well, I, I, knowing that I wanted to go home, I've been watching everybody do this over and over and over again and doing it myself in my head, visualizing it, doing it myself in my head. He said, so when I came to it, it didn't feel like it was the first time I did it. It was like, I, it was like, oh, had I've seen it done a hundred times, I, I could do it. Um, and he did it successfully. He learned how to run the machine and do his treatments with it in the first week. I mean, in fact, I kept him the second week just because I'm like, there's, this was early on. I'm like, there's no way I can send this guy home after a week of training. We got to keep him a little bit longer so that we can make sure that we know what he's doing. Um, but he was, you know, realistically, he was ready to go home after that first week. Um, and, and, the, and in terms of longevity, um, this gentleman's still on home hemo today. Um, and, and the thing that I take away from that was that, you know, nobody wanted to, to believe in him. Nobody wanted to give him the opportunity, but I fought for him and he got it and he was able to do it. And 14 years later, you know, here we are, he's still doing it, you know? And the thing that really kind of, you know, keeps me motivated and keeps me passionate about what I do is that, you know, every couple of times a year, I get a text message from him with the picture. Um, the most meaningful ones have been pictures where he sent me a picture of him at, on the 50 yard line with his daughter at homecoming, her uh, being crowned homecoming queen. Um, you know, his son's graduating basic training uh, from their military service. And he was there with them taking pictures at their graduation. And the thing that I took from that was he would text me those pictures and he would say, remember when we started out this journey, he's like, I didn't expect to see my kids grow up. His kids were small. They were like in elementary school when he came to me. And now they're, they're graduating college and, and they're, they're moving on in their life and they're graduating and doing big things. And he's seeing all of that and experiencing all that. He sends me vacation pictures. And all that to say is like, this is a man who didn't expect to live more than five years on dialysis, who has now been there for 14 years to watch his kids grow up. All of that and an opportunity wouldn't have happened had I not like really advocated for him and really stepped up and made that impact in his life. He, he may not be here today. And, and we all have that same power and that same ability as clinicians working in the facilities. We can impact, even if it's just one person that you can impact like that, um, it, it's worth it. It's worth it and think about it. And we just have to step outside of our own, um, our own biases and really think about our patients and saying like how, you know, cause I never at that point never would have thought that that would have been the impact that I could have had on his life. Um, and I can't, I, and there's probably more that I don't even know about because there's, there's others I haven't stayed connected with over the years. So think about that. It's always about, you know, you never know where those patients are going to end up and, and how successful they're going to be. So it's always important to give them an opportunity to fail rather than just assume they, that they will. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's uh, stop recording and